Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 13, Motion and Forces. We're basically beginning a new unit with this lecture. We've learned how to describe motion with pictures, graphs, and equations up until this point. But until now, we've said nothing to explain the motion. So in this lecture, we will turn our attention to the uh, cause of motion, and that is forces. This topic is called dynamics which joins with something called kinematics to form what we call mechanics, the general science of motion. We'll begin our study of dynamics qualitatively in the beginning, and then add quantitative details over the series of the next several lectures. So let's start with the basics. So consider a slide, or a sled, excuse me, that is moving along various surfaces. Let's say at first the sled is moving along snow. Maybe not all of us have experience sledding on snow, but you can imagine that if someone pushes the sled and lets go, the sled will move, but slow down and come to a stop. We'll now take that same sled and move it on slick ice. Well, if you push the sled on slick ice, it's going to end up going a little bit further, or perhaps quite further, before it eventually does come to a stop again. So let's take this a step further. What we're talking about is friction involved in this process. There's a lot of friction between the sled and the snow. There's less friction between the ice and the sled. So let's take it all the way to the extreme and say, what if there was no friction whatsoever? If that's the case, well, then the person on the sled will keep moving at the same speed. They would never slow down. And so, a good analogy of this, I suppose, would be an air hockey table. Um, if you've ever played air hockey, when you don't pay and there's just a puck sitting on the table, it's very hard to move it. I mean, you can hit it around the table, but it will stop very quickly. But when you pay and put the money in and uh, turn the air hockey table on, there's little holes all over the surface that blow air upward beneath the puck. So the puck actually almost levitates on the surface, reducing the friction and then that puck slides all over the surface with ease. So this is actually hinting at one of Newton's laws. Now we're gonna come back to Newton's laws later on, but we should at least while we're here discuss his first law. So there's been a lot of work done over the last couple centuries involving Galileo and Newton to verify this particular rule. And we call this a law because we found that this Newton's first law of motion, it applies to everything that we know of it within the realm of the universe that we're in. So anyway, the point is Newton's first law of motion states the following. Consider an object that has no forces acting on it. So no friction or anything like that. If this object is at rest, it's going to remain at rest. Now that's pretty straightforward. I mean, if there's just an object sitting there on your table, it's not going to move unless something acts to move it. However, if the object is moving and there's no forces acting on it, then it will continue to move in a straight line and at a constant speed. So there's nothing acting on it to push it or pull it or slow it down, pick, make it pick up speed, anything like that. And so it just moves in a straight line at a constant speed. This is the premise of Newton's first law. A very interesting application of Newton's first law is a crash test in a vehicle. As you can see on the right, there's a dummy placed inside the vehicle, and it's not strapped in with the seatbelt. While the car is in motion, the person, or the dummy in this case, is moving at the same speed as the car. They're moving together. But the instant the car slams into the uh, crash test barrier, the dummy is going to keep moving forward at that same speed. There's nothing really there to stop it if you're not wearing a seatbelt. And so the dummy keeps moving forward with the speed that it had initially. And so that's why the car stops, but then you keep moving. I keep saying you. Let's think of it as a dummy. I'm not calling you a dummy. You get the idea. The dummy keeps moving forward and without the seatbelt will smash into the front of the dash. So this is the basic idea of Newton's first law applied to a crash test dummy. So this whole time we're talking about forces. In the most basic possible sense, we can think of a force as a push or a pull. 
and it's best introduced, uh, best to introduce forces um, by looking at examples of common ones that we uh, can use to consider all the basic properties involved. So they're all, regardless of what the force is, a push or a pull. So that's our basic way of understanding it. We say that a force acts on an object, and we also say that every force has an agent. In other words, it's something that's causing the pushing or the pulling. It's something that's applying the force. So in the example above, you see someone with a shot put. They are pushing that shot put into the air, so they are applying a force to it. On the right, you see uh, a man punching a um, one of those uh, bags. And what you see there is the agent, the person causing the force, interacting with the object, the punching bag. Now, a very important discussion is, or concept to understand is that force is a vector. It has a direction. So you're always going to be pushing or pulling something in a particular direction. So we say force is a vector as a result. And we represent force, just the general force, not any specific one, with the capital letter F, and note that the arrow above it indicates it's a vector. The magnitude, in other words, the strength of the vector, is just given by lowercase, or excuse me, by capital F without the arrow. Now, we basically consider force to be one of two different categories. We say that forces can be either a contact force, which is when you have the force acting on an object by directly touching it, such as in the bottom right, you see a baseball bat applying a force to a baseball by physical contact. But a little bit more uncommon are long range forces. These are forces that act on an object without, without touching it at all. So the common one that we encounter in everyday life is gravity, the acceleration due to gravity. Gravity acts on objects at a distance. If you pick up a pen and hold it in the air and then drop it, Nothing's physically there pulling the pen downward, it's just gravity acting from a distance. So we consider that to be a long-range force, like you see with the coffee cup in the bottom. Now, again, force is a vector. And recall that we represent vectors graphically by an arrow. So we use a dot to represent the picture, or uh, the particle, or the object, whatever you have. You draw your arrow away from your object in the direction of the force. And the size of your arrow is proportional to how strong of a force that is applied. And then of course, don't forget to label it. This will become especially relevant starting in our next lecture, but it is so important to label your vectors and you'll see why very soon. Now, because force is a vector and you might encounter situations where multiple forces are acting on a single object, we have to worry about what we call the net force. So let's say you have multiple forces, F1, 2, 3, and so on, being exerted on an object. Well, rather than think of them individually, we can actually combine them all into a single net or total force. And we say that it is the vector sum of all the forces. In other words, that's our fancy way of saying you add them all up. So the net force will be the sum of all forces together. But keep, be careful, uh, you don't just add up the numbers here because these are vectors. Vectors can be pointing in different directions. So you can't just say force one is 100, force two is 100, force three is 100, and that doesn't mean you get 300, um, unless they're all pointing in the same direction. So just be careful, this is where you have to deal with vector components and things like that. But Again, let's keep the math out of it for this lecture. We'll get to that later. Now, I add in this little point at the end just to clarify. The net force isn't something new. It's not something extra that's pushing or pulling on your object. It just replaces those individual ones. So you can see this in the example here on the bottom right. You see a box uh, from the top down in figure A. Someone is pulling with a rope on that box up and to the right and then another person is pulling downward. On the right, in figure B, you can see the forces being represented as arrows. Force 1 being applied up and to the right, force 2 being applied downward. So overall, the general motion of this object is going to, I mean, if you think about this conceptually, it should probably be pulled somewhere in 
roughly that direction. And so we should see the net force pointing that way. And that's exactly what happens. When you look at the net forces here on the right hand side, you see F1 pointing upward and to the right. Well, recall we do something called the head to tail method to add vectors graphically. So you just take the second vector and place its tail at the head of the first. So what that means is you basically just draw F2 right here. So we can label that F2. And once you do that, to get your net force, you just draw an arrow from your starting point at the box to your end point, where the arrows end up. And there is your net force, confirming that the object would be pulled sort of down and to the right. Again, this is something we'll get to again later, uh, especially with math involved. But let's keep with the theme of keeping things a little bit simple in this lecture. Our goal now, just to finish out this lecture, is to simply go through each type of force that we might encounter in this course. So this is like a catalog of forces. Here on Earth, every single object has a force known as the weight of the object. Weight is the gravitational pull of the Earth on any object that is at or near the surface of the planet. The symbol for weight is lowercase w. Now, for each of these forces, we're going to discuss the direction in which it is applied. This is one of the simplest ones to think about in terms of direction. Gravity is always pulling downward. So, an object's weight, which is due to gravity, also always points vertically downward. And it doesn't matter what your object is doing. Like you see in the right, it doesn't matter if you have a basketball that is sitting at rest, rolling across the ground, being thrown up into the air, falling down to the ground, or in two-dimensional motion, as in projectile motion, it doesn't matter. The weight of the object always points straight down because gravity is always acting downward on it. So, this is the very first force we encounter, and it is the most common force because any example that we do on Earth has a weight. So, you'll see this quite commonly throughout future problems. Another very common force that we encounter in this course is tension. When a string or rope, or sometimes a wire, pulls on an object, it will exert a contact force that we call tension. Tension is given by the capital letter T, and its direction is always in the direction of the string or rope. So, you see in the example on the right-hand side, a sled being pulled by a rope. The direction of your tension force is in the direction of the rope, so in this case, up and to the right. So, all things considered, it's another one that's fairly easy to remember the direction of. Just draw an arrow along the rope that you're using to pull an object with, and that is your direction of the tension force. The next force is a little bit more, I suppose, unfamiliar to people. Although, it's something we are all encountering even in this very second. Me teaching the lecture and you watching it whenever you're watching this. This is the normal force. We call it normal not because it's just common or boring or whatever. The normal force is a force exerted by a surface against any object that is pressing against the surface. In other words, it's sort of like the surface pushing back. The symbol for the normal force is lowercase n, and its direction is always perpendicular to the surface. This is where the term normal comes from. In mathematics, perpendicular and normal mean the same thing. So anytime you say like an arrow is normal to the surface, that means it's perpendicular or 90 degrees off of the surface. So. Uh, there's a number of ways to think about this. Right now, pr presumably, we're all sitting in a chair. Well, weight, your weight, is acting downward. Meaning, theoretically, gravity is trying to pull you downward. Well, that's not theoretical. That's just a fact. Gravity is trying to pull you downward. So, in theory, you should be moving downward. But you're not. We're sitting in place in our chair. So there has to be something acting against our weight, to hold us in place. And that is this normal force. So, um, and this acts on any surface, so 
It could be, you know, us sitting in our chair, so the normal force points straight up off of our chair. It could be me leaning against a wall. If I'm leaning against the wall, the wall pushes back straight off the wall. If I'm pushing up against my ceiling for whatever crazy reason, the ceiling will push back down against my hand. And so on. I like the example here in the bottom right of a skier just because even if your surface is inclined at an angle, the normal force still points perpendicularly straight off of the surface. So in the top right, I show kind of a, a zoomed in view here, like at a molecular level. In general, the idea is that um, any solid is built up of a network of atoms that are locked in place with one another. They have this crystalline form. And so basically, if you're sitting in your chair or pushing up against a wall, you are slightly deforming the surface at a very molecular level. Something you're not, hopefully, you're not like warping the wall when you hold onto it or, you know, warping your chair too much when you're sitting in it. But the idea is that it's that kind of like a molecular spring force that kind of resists that uh, compression, and so it pushes back. But that goes way beyond the scope of the course. Just know that surfaces effectively push back. Those are what I would consider to be the four common forces that we encounter. Oh no, that was only three. Uh, was it? Yeah, that was only three. Excuse me. Um, a fourth force that we might encounter once in a while, this one's more uncommon, is the spring force. Springs exert spring forces when they're compressed or stretched. If your spring is compressed, like you see in the GIF at the top, it's going to resist that motion and push back outward. So you can't really see that happening in the animation, but just imagine if you take a spring and compress it like this person is doing, you know that it feels like it's resisting you. It wants to spring back or push back out to its original form. And if you stretch a spring, say you take two hands on either side of a spring and pull it apart, well, when you do that, you can feel it resisting and trying to pull back inwards. It wants to snap back in toward its original configuration. So these are forces, right? Springs exert forces by either pushing or pulling when they're either compressed or stretched, respectively. The symbol for spring force is a capital letter, excuse me, capital letter F with the subscript SP for spring. This one we encounter very rarely, but it does come up. Another very common force is friction. Up until this point in the course, we've ignored friction. Um, we've ignored friction and air resistance, basically any complicating factor we ignored for a basic introduction to uh, the material in physics. But now that we're talking about forces, we can formally introduce this. Friction, like the normal force, is a force exerted on an object by a surface. The general symbol for friction is lowercase f, but there's two types of friction. There is kinetic friction, F sub K, which acts on any object sliding across a surface. It is a resisting force, also known as a retarding force, and so it's going to always act to oppose your motion. So as you can see in the example on the left is a person on a sled. They're moving to the right, so friction is going to resist that by acting to the left. But there's another type of friction, and that is static friction, or F sub S. This is the friction force that keeps objects quote-unquote stuck on surfaces, preventing their motion. So you can see here on the right, a person is trying to pull a very heavy crate, but it doesn't move. So they're pulling on it, they're applying a force, but it's not moving. So something is resisting that, and that is our static force, the force keeping an object stuck in place. Similarly, it always points in the direction necessary to prevent motion because it is a resisting force. Okay. There's two more forces we might encounter. In this one, uh, drag corresponds to our air resistance that we've talked about in the past, but ignored. The force of a fluid, such as air or water, on a moving object is called drag. You can see in the image on the right-hand side, a leaf falling to the ground doesn't just accelerate due to gravity straight down to the surface. It kind of like is very slowly lofts down to the ground. It can kind of, you know, sway side to side as it does so. And that's because air is resisting its motion a little bit. And this resistance 
uh, or this resisting force is what we call drag, given by the capital letter D. Much like friction, this is a resisting force, so it always points opposite the direction of motion. So, if our leaf is falling down to the ground, drag points up against that. Despite the fact that I'm introducing drag to you now, we still neglect it and ignore it in every problem that we deal with unless it tells us otherwise. So it's still a complicating factor and it goes into some fluid mechanics that is beyond the scope of the course, so for the most part we ignore it until we can't. The very last force we may encounter is thrust. This is the force that occurs when a jet or rocket engine expels gases at high speeds. The symbol for thrust, we're running out of subscripts and creativity at this point, we just call it capital F with the subscript thrust. Now the direction in this case, this one is a little tricky, students tend to uh, mix these up. Gas is expelled, in the case on the right, downward by the rocket. Imagine this being like a SpaceX launch. Gases are expelled downward, so the vehicle is thrusted upwards. So a lot of times students will say the thrust force is down in the direction of the gas, but that is not the case. It's about the force acting on your object. So again, the gases are moving downwards, that thrusts and propels your material, or in this case rocket, upwards. Okay. So again, this is just a very basic overview of the forces we will encounter. We actually have equations for most of these forces that we'll introduce uh, a bit more slowly in future lectures. To conclude with this lecture, let's just go over a few questions. What I'll do is read the question. I won't take the time to read the answers, but I'll read the question and then um, give just a second or two. You can pause the video and think about the answer, and then I'll go over it with you. So, question one. A ball rolls down an incline and off of a horizontal ramp. Ignoring air resistance, what force or forces act on the ball as it moves through the air just after leaving the ramp? Okay. Well, after it leaves the ramp, ask yourself, what is acting on the ball? What is pushing or pulling on the ball? Once it leaves the ramp, the only thing acting on your object is its weight. The only thing acting on your object is weight. So the answer in this case is A. There's nothing else touching your object, so there's no contact forces, and the only long-range force acting on your object is weight. Again, note that we are ignoring drag or air resistance. Sometimes students like to choose uh, like weight and a force in the direction of motion or something that maintains its motion. But again, that's kind of just a trick. Ask yourself what's actually acting on the object. Once it leaves the ramp, it's just weight. Question two. A steel beam hangs from a cable as a crane lifts the beam. What forces are acting on the beam? All right, well, in this case, uh, let's say we have just, you know, here's our cable. It's supposed to be straight, you get the idea. And here's our beam. It's at an angle from the way I'm writing, apologies for that. Well, you have two forces acting on this. Like everything on Earth, you're gonna have a weight force pointing downward, but we also have a tension force because we're using a rope in this case, or uh, a cable, as it says. So we actually have a tension force as well. So we have a weight pulling this object down, a tension holding it up. So the answer in this case is B, weight and tension. There's no force of motion. Again, that's kind of just a trick. Um, the object can be moving, but it's moving because of the tension in the cable. And so um, there's no extra force. Again, my way of looking at this is just ask yourself what's acting on the object the long-range force of weight, and the only contact force, the only thing touching it, is the tension in the cable. All right, one more question to conclude our lecture. Question three. A bobsledder pushes a sled across horizontal snow to get it going, and then jumps in. After she jumps in, the sled gradually slows to a halt. 
what forces act on the sled after she's jumped in. Okay, uh, I'm just going to represent our sled as a dot, as we do with the particle model. So let's think about the forces that are acting on our sled. Like everything on Earth, I mean, this is the, the first force most people think about. Weight, right? We have a weight pulling downward on our object. Well, keep in mind that this object is on a surface, right? The sled is on a surface. That surface pushes back. I'm trying to draw straight. I'm still struggling with that. My apologies. Uh, this is supposed to be N, the normal force, pushing up against the sled. But that's not all. It says the sled is gradually slowing to a halt, indicating that there is friction. So let's just say the object is moving to the right. Well, that means we're going to have a friction force opposing that motion back to the left. And in this case, because the object is moving, it's kinetic friction, Fk. So, in this case, the answer is D. We have those three forces acting on the object. Note that it is not E because the person is no longer pushing the object. It says after she jumps in, what are the forces? If she was still pushing on the object, this is an if, then there would be a force of the person pushing on it. We would just call that, say, F push. You can call it whatever you want. We don't really have a specific symbol for that. So if they were still pushing it, then there would also be that force. Okay, uh, that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to actually look in detail on how to draw the diagrams that I've just made. We call these free body diagrams. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.